as most people here will know that uh, Chan and Zen Buddhism uh, is the, um, one of the uh, first uh, Buddhist traditions to cross uh, boundaries to the West um, and uh, make, a, make a major impact there. And my paper today focuses on one of the leading figures in that tradition, Matsu Dawi, or as he's often referred to as Patriarch Ma, which is what Matsu means. Um, and um, he's, he is one of the key figures um, in the Chan and Zen tradition, and also I would mention also in the Korean Son tradition. Um, so prior to his um, introduction to the West, uh, he has had a long um, career, shall we say, of influence uh, throughout East Asia. He's especially credited with uh, the unique ch uh, Chan innovation known as encounter dialogue, Encounter dialogues uh, constitute one of the unique features of Chan Yulu, or dialogue records, and serve as a defining f feature of the Chan movement. Until recently, it was commonly assumed that Yulu and encounter dialogue were the products of a unique Tang dynasty Chan culture, initiated by masters hailing from Chan's so-called golden age. Recent work on the Lin Ji Lu, the record of Lin Ji, exposed how dialogue records attributed to Lin Ji were shaped over time into typical encounter dialogue events that did not reach maturity, a mature form until the early Song Dynasty. Uh, and recent work on Maotsu, Matsu has also shown how his reputation as an iconoclast derives from later sources. Uh, it's also been pointed out that in earlier sources, Matsu appears as a rather sedate and deliberate champion of the doctrine of innate Buddha nature, uh, and um, um, which is a uh, contrast with his uh, more iconoclastic uh, encounter dialogue style that we see in uh, later sources. And this, um, um, we might say, reevaluation of Matsu is particularly borne out in the Tsong Jing Lu, which is the text that I want to analyze today. Um, and the fragments in the Tsong Jing Lu, I, uh, I, talk, I say that they're the lost fragments, and ironically, they've been known to us in plain sight all along, but they were virtually ignored because they did not fit orthodox interpretation. And uh, so, uh, Yen Cho's, uh, the, the compiler of the Tsong Jing Lu, was not regarded as a quote unquote real Chan master uh, because of his uh, differing interpretation, differing style of Chan. And so what I want to do today is I want to uh, kind of look at w uh, one of these fragments in particular and try to restore not only Matsu to uh, some idea of a fuller idea of who Matsu was as a Chan master, but also to restore the Tsong Jing Lu as a viable text uh, for studying alongside the um, usual Chan records, which are the uh, transmission records and the dialogue records, which uh, most people focus on. Um, in spite of the rather tame, prosaic character of the teaching attributed to Matsu in early sources, his reputation in Chan and, and Zen traditions affirms his central role as the progenitor of the iconoclastic um, uh, movement Chan and Zen are most noted for. Yongming Yensho, compiler of the Tsung Jing Lu, acknowledged what must have been a growing trend to interpret Matsu as an, as an iconoclast, uh, a trend that was already evident in the, uh, uh, in the Tang dynasty. Um, so, Yensho is a, a, a compilation of the Tsung Jing Lu in, in the case of uh, Matsu seems uh, particularly aimed at countering this trend to look at Matsu in this kind of way. And he wants to um, propose that Matsu's teaching was not a iconoclastic, but fully compatible with doctrinal teachings. And I should say, of course, this corresponds with Yensho's own view. This line of argument represents a significant change in our understanding of Yen Cho and his position in the development of Chan. Uh, previously, when Matsu was assumed to be the champion of radical iconoclastic Chan, they characterized uh, him as, uh, with uh, an aggressive antinomian uh, style. 
Yencho's characterization of Matsu was deemed uh, as an, an, an anachronistic um, and a, a wishful fancy of who, a fantasy of who Yencho would like uh, Matsu to be, but a far cry from ma who Matsu actually was. The discovery of the Tsutongji in the 20th century, coupled with a more text critical approach to the uh, sources of Matsu's teachings, have reshaped our understanding of Matsu along the, the lines that I have described and made us more aware of the forces in the later Chan tradition that animated Matsu as champion of Chan iconoclasm. Uh, iconoclasm. Um, this makes a reevaluation of Yensho's characterization of Matsu both timely and significant. This is not to suggest that Yensho's depiction of Matsu is unbiased or lacking in motivation close to Yensho's own, Yensho's own heart. It does suggest that Yensho's characterization not be casually discarded as irrelevant, but be entertained as a further piece in our understanding of Matsu and the pressure, pressures influencing how he came to be interpreted within the Chan community. In the eyes of Yensho, Matsu Daoi and other Hangzhou faction masters were like any other Chan master worthy of the name, relying on scripturally based doctrinal teachings to promote John Chan principles. On the basis of this, the suggestion that the Matsu inspired um, Hang Hangzhou faction stood for an interpretation of Chan independent of the scriptures and doctrinally based practices was un untenable. Um, okay, so in order to um, uh, demonstrate the effect of Yencho's portrayal, I'm going to contrast the fragments of Machu's teachings as they're uh, characterized by Yencho and the Tsongcheng Lu with those recorded in the Chan uh, transmission, transmission records. The fragment I'm going to look at is a, um, um, uh, shows Matsu's um, commentary on the Lankavatara Sutra. Of course, the Lankavatara Sutra uh, is a very important text in the Chan tradition. Um, it, uh, in in um, that one significant tradition, it was allegedly the text that Bodhidharma brought with him from India to China and transmitted as representing of his, representative of his Chan teaching, the Lankavatara Sutra. Um, but this um, created a tension within the Chan movement because as l the Linji faction interpretation um, uh, developed, it um, uh, proposed an interpretation of Chan as a special or a separate transmission outside the teaching. Okay, so outside the scriptures. So, and I guess th th this creates a kind of tension because on the one hand we have Bodhidharma representing, transmitting the scriptures, the Lankavatara Sutra on the one hand, now we have an interpretation of Chan which is becoming very dominant uh, in the Linji faction saying, no, no, we're, we're a separate transmission, we don't depend on scriptures. So this, these two things don't s sit side by side very comfortably. So this is kind of what's at stake um, in these texts here, that Yencho, his, as I'll show here shortly, his understanding of uh, Matsu is very much in line with him transmitting the scriptures and basing his teaching on the Lankavatara Sutra, as opposed to the, the Chan lineage transmission records, the Yulu, di the Chan dialogue records. They promote more uh, consistently an image of uh, Matsu uh, that does, is independent of the scriptures. That, that um, of course, in the Chan tradition, the Chan master is the Buddha, is the representative of the Buddha. The, the transmission has passed down from master to master all the way to the Chan master. So they don't need to rely on the scriptures. They are the, the scriptures, in a sense. What they say is, is the word of the Buddha. They don't have to rely on the, the word of the Buddha that lived long ago and far away. So this is the kind of tension that's being set up um, within the tradition. So uh, I'm going to, I'm not, um, the passage that Yencho focuses on, the Lankavatara Sutra passage, the Buddha taught that mind is the implicit truth and gatelessness is the, is the Dharma gate. That Matsu's commentary in the, um, 
uh, Tsung Jing Lu, uh, Yen Cho's uh, uh, compiled Tsung Jing Lu, has four sections where I've divided it actually into four sections. It, it reads as one section in the text. But the first three sections that I'm going to present have no counterpart in either the Tzu Tong Ji or the Chuan Dong Li. These are the transmission records that I talk about, the Chan transmission records that promote Chan uh, more in terms of uh, uh, an independent tr tradition outside the scriptures. So in a sense, they excise the, the, the large portion of commentary. They, they omit it from there. And we would know nothing about it except uh, uh, through Yen Shou's text in the Tsung Jing Lu. So this drastically changes our idea, I contend, who Matsu was. Because in the other tradition, we have this very short statement, which I'll come to at the end, section four, which is simply um, um, you know, a statement by Matsu with uh, uh, some reference to the Lankavatara Sutra, but very short reference. Whereas the three sections that I introduce here, um, and I, I don't think, uh, you know, fortunately for us, we don't have to go through this in detail. I'm not, we're not interested so much in the content here as, you know, okay, why does the Lankavatara Sutra say, and then he goes on and he um, uh, talks about it, um, gives a kind of a long exegetical commentary. Now, again, this is in the Tsung Jing Lu, but in no other text. Okay, this is only in the Tsung Jing Lu. Okay, then he goes on and on and on. And then, uh, again, the next part, the, therefore the scriptures say, okay, so again, he's, he's, he's uh, constant reference to the scriptures. Uh, and then also down here at the bottom, if we go, on my pointer doesn't seem to be working. But anyway, you can see uh, it's, it's on the bullet points, the bullet point at the bottom again. So what we see is quotation from scriptures followed by commentary. Quotation from scriptures followed by commentary. Okay, this is a very conventional style. This does not distinguish uh, Matsu as Chan master from uh, Matsu as any other kind of Buddhist master. Maybe in terms of the content, some people may say, okay, there's some, some Chan elements uh, uh, to it. But in large part, even then, I think we might be hard pressed to, to um, um, make much on that score. Okay, and then section three, again, it's the same thing. The, therefore, the scriptures say, um, uh, and then it goes on. And here, okay, there, that is why a scripture, and it turns out it's the Vimala Kirti Sutra says, okay, so we had this, uh, and, then, and then down at the bottom, that this is why the Lankavatara Sutra says, uh, and so forth. So, um, Again, uh, I just to reiterate, this is from the sections of the Tsung Jing Lu that are not recorded elsewhere. And so most people, you know, most um, uh, people who follow the Chan or Zen tradition are unaware, completely unaware of this aspect because they don't, they, they've never seen it in the Tsung Jing Lu. They're only aware of the image of Matsu that's been presented to them in the transmission records or the Matsu Yulu. Now, okay, let's go to the, f the section that they do have in common. I'm gonna, uh, oh, this is section three. Okay, I'm, uh, uh, anyway, it makes the same point. Section four, this is the section four of the Tsung Jing Lu text, but I'm going to go to um, um, uh, the counterpart uh, in the Tzu Tong Ji and the Chuan Dong Lu. And again, these are the transmission record texts that are, are the, uh, we might say they're more in line with the orthodox uh, tradition of, of uh, Chan interpretation. Okay, it, the Lankavatara Sutra also says, and I wanna stop just uh, there for a moment because, um, you know, in here, you know, we can identify it as with the Lankavatara Sutra, but um, it, it actually says, and in, in fact, if you, if you read it in the Matsu Yulu, the, the, the record, dialogue record of Matsu, which is compiled a little bit later on, it's Matsu who's doing the speaking. There's no, there's no reference to scriptures at all, mm. right? So, and again, this is in line that M Matsu is the authority. M you know, the, the, <laughs> the words of truth, of Buddhist truth come from Matsu. They don't come from the scriptures. Th and this is in line with kind of orthodox, Lin Ji Chan interpretation 
that has privileged the Chan master above the scriptures. You know, again, uh, as I mentioned before, I come back to the, the, the separate transmission apart from the scriptures, which uh, Linji Chan Buddhism is uh, famous for uh, in, in many of its writings. Okay, so if we see it, you know, here it says, it, the Lankavatara Sutra says, but if we say, Matsu says, th there's no quotation marks. Those who seek the Buddha Dharma should not seek anything. It's, it, it, it's as if Matsu himself is saying it. Um, there is no Buddha separate from mind. There is no mind separate from Buddha. Do not grasp good. Do not reject evil. Uh, get the, oh, here. Okay, the Chinese, for those of you who can read it up here, it's Bu Chu Shan Bu Sha Wu. Uh, do not um, grasp good. Do not reject evil. But if we go back, and it's funny how one word can make all the difference. If we go back to the Yencho's version, the Tsung Jeng Lu, it's do not grasp good, do not create evil. Bu Chu Shan Bu Wu. Right? And, you know, a lot of times in, in Chinese texts, there are little character variations and there are, uh, you know, maybe uh, com uh, compilers, errors, and things like this. This is not one of those. <laughs> this is a very deliberate um, change, you know, and it, because it, it really emphasizes what both traditions want to say about Matsu and about, you know, what they think is the essence of Chan. So if you say, do not grasp good, do not create evil. This is a kind of a, I would say, a very conventional Buddhist idea. You know, okay, and you don't want to grasp good. Your grasping is not good. But uh, obviously, you don't want to create evil, either. But if we look at the the transmission record versions, um, do not grasp good. Do not reject evil. It's this this uh, commitment. We might say radical commitment to non-duality. <laughs> Right, you, so you, you you don't grasp good. You're not attached to good, but you don't reject evil. You, you know, you can't uh, you, you can't create a duality, right? If you if you uh, if you uh, um, if you uh, reject evil, you're creating this kind of duality between good and evil. Um, anyway, uh, I think this uh, it's a you know apparently a very small thing, but it has a major difference, and it really um, um, consolidates the uh, um, the difference between the two interpretations. Um, okay, I think um, I, I think we can probably just go to the conclusion here, um, and uh, the concluding remarks basically uh, are of two types. One is uh, one uh, the interpretation of Matsu and its implications for Chan tradition. Um, Okay, so the, uh, the Tsung Jing Lu presents Matsu as the opposite of a, uh, as an iconoclast or someone who engages in, in counter dialogue or even as someone who usurps the role of the Buddha, right? He's somebody who is a prosaic, he's just a normal sermonizer and exegete, uh, which we find throughout, this, uh, the, the, throughout the Chinese tradition. So the Tsung Jing Lu challenges the interpretation of Matsu in terms of encounter dialogue and a separate transmission and challenges our image of what true Chan is. Uh, um, you know, according to Yencho and uh, according to Yencho and the Tsung Jing Lu, a tr any true Chan master is someone who relies on the scriptures, who bases themselves on the scriptures. Uh, you, you cannot reject the scriptures. You cannot reject the word of the Buddha. So uh, that's, the, that's the first point. The second point is the, uh, the importance of the Tsung Jing Lu for the study of Chan, which I alluded to before, that the Chan fragments and the Tsung Jing Lu, I should mention um, to people, the Tsung Jing Lu is this huge text, a hundred fascicles. Uh, and so it, it's huge to the po point that for most people it's just daunting. And uh, they, they look at it and they think, what do I do with that? And, and it's not really organized in a very... Um, transparent style, right? Um, so it's very difficult to penetrate this. But, uh, so what I have done with the text is I've extracted the fragments of Chan teaching, which actually aren't a large amount of the, uh, of the text as a whole, because 100 fascicles, it's a huge, uh, huge, huge text. But 
if you extract all of those fragments, and there are a couple fascicles that are specifically de devoted to uh, Chan fragments, but it, so if you take, and take those that are interspersed in, in those couple fascicles, you actually get a fairly sizable um, uh, repository of Chan fragments, which is roughly comparable to, for example, the Tsutongji. Not quite as big, the, the Tsutongji is a, is a text that was uh, discovered in Korea in the 1930s, and it's one of these transmission records which has greatly enhanced our understanding of Chan, and the, 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 re the fragments that it contains are highly valued and, and uh, meticulously studied. And so the, the irony for me is the Tsong Jing Lu, which has been around forever, it entered the canon back in the Tsong period, and it's been reissued uh, forever in China, in Korea, in Japan. So it's always been available. But the, fra the Chan fragments there have n n not, have been very, I, I can't say that they've uh, been completely unnoticed, but they've been completely underutilized, I think, for the purposes uh, of what I've done here. And I think, so if we look at, uh, if we restore these, it raises the question as what maybe uh, of an interpretation of Chan, an in alternate interpretation of Chan than the uh, separate transmission outside the scriptures, but maybe a special transmission within the scriptures. And I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Guanxin.